welcome to another episode of Breadcast Movie and TV Talk. This is going to be the final movie review of 2019, with my top 11 movies of 2019 being the next one in this series. So, this is going to be my discussion for the movie Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. As usual, I'm going to give a non-spoiler part and then go into full spoilers, so let's start with the non-spoiler section. And please note, this is going to be long. In my opinion, Rise of the Skywalker is not as terrible as people are making it out to be. It's not a perfect movie, but it's not a bad movie. It is way better than The Last Jedi. There are characters from The Last Jedi that are not in this movie as much, and there are two new characters that were perfectly put in the movie and had just enough backstory to them to be in the movie as background characters, like they are supposed to be. There is a good amount of fan service, and most of the classic Star Wars characters uh, pretty much are gone after this movie. The rest of the cast did great in the movie. There are some things that raise questions and things left unexplained, but I don't feel like it hurt the movie that much. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is a good movie and an enjoyable movie. Now with the non-spoiler section out of the way, let's go into full spoilers. One of the biggest things that really weighs on this movie is the fact that everything goes by so quick and that there is no time to breathe and things are left unexplained, but it's all because they really don't give the movie time to explain things at all. Right off the start of the movie, we are with Kylo Ren fighting some people and grabbing a small pyramid thing. What is it? Who cares? We will explain it later since it'll be more important then. So then Kylo goes to a planet that we won't name until later and oh Emperor Palpatine, woo! He explains that he grew and trained Snoke and basically has been pulling the strings this whole trilogy. Palpatine reveals that he's got a whole fleet of old Star Destroyers that if Kylo can kill Rey then Palpatine will put him in charge of this fleet of like 10,000 ships. Question number one, where did Palpatine get these Star Destroyers? Did he make them normally or just will them into existence through the power of the Sith? What about all the people on those Star Destroyers? Where did they come from? I will not dwell on this much because literally everyone has been asking this question. But another question is why can't this fleet leave the planet? Why is there only one in charge of navigation? How do all these Star Destroyers have planet killing giant guns? Okay, enough questions about all that. Keeping with the start in the movie, we then catch up with Poe, Finn, and friends on the Falcon. They're at the end of a mission to get intel from a spy within the First Order on the escape part as TIE fighters are chasing the Falcon. Poe, who is piloting, does something that he called light speed skipping. What the heck is that? Like, Poe just kept doing single light speed jumps at random and kept getting lucky that he didn't jump into a mountain or something and smash into bits. I asked one of my friends about this and he said that apparently they did it in the Star Wars Rebels series, but I mean, this is the first time it's brought up in the movies, so most of us don't know about it. Plus, this is the only time in the movie that they do light speed skipping prime because they realize it's stupid. Let me talk about Rey specifically. The whole movie, there was like this veil of mystery around her. There would be times that she's with the group, and then she would just stop, look in a direction, and then start walking there. And yes, I know it's the Force telling her what to do or where to go, but it often just felt random. But in this movie, we finally get the fact that Rey is a Palpatine by blood. She's the grandchild of the Emperor. The whole thing with her parents from The Force Awakens is that some Sith guy came to find her and that person killed Rey's parents. But the whole goal of his was to get Rey and deliver her to the Emperor because she's supposed to be the Empress of the Galaxy. This whole That's why this whole movie... Ray walks a very fine line between is she a Jedi or will she be become blah 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 or will she become a Sith and with her explaining her visions of herself and Kylo in the Sith throne room there's a moment on that planet where the special party's happening that Finn tells Ray that the first order took Chewie and she looks at this first order transport ship and 
on its way out and just she just force grabs it and tries to pull it down but it's interrupted by kylo who somehow makes force lightning shoot out of her hands and blow up the ship after you know getting in a little force battle so most people think chewie is dead but he's not the question here is how did kylo make ray do lightning fingers kylo has never been shown to perform that force ability so was this palpatine taking control of kylo taking control of ray of course, Ray, assuming that Chewie has just been killed, um, blames herself for the death, but she didn't really kill him because he was on another transport ship. Ray was not bad at all in the movie, but there were things that raised que- that raised questions, like Ray, who is the Ray is the one who finally tells. Um, the resistance about the pyramid thing that's called a Sith Wayfinder that has the sole purpose of leading them to the planet that Palpatine is on. I don't understand where Rey learns to heal things with the Force. See, in the prequel trilogy, Palpatine mentions to Anakin that a Jedi should have knowledge of both sides of the Force and mentions that there are Sith that have the ability to stop people from dying. Now, we actually get to see someone do this, but I thought it odd for someone being a Jedi doing a Sith Force ability. Now, the first thing about Rey at the end of the movie is where she goes back to Tatooine, to Luke's original home, to wrap up Luke and Leia's lightsabers and bury them in the sand, and then Rey has a new lightsaber. Her lightsaber has a very black colored hilt but the blade is yellow what does that mean i bring this up because in star wars the crafting of a lightsaber is a very big and crucial step in becoming a jedi but on top of that the color of the blade is also representative of the jedi constructing the lightsaber it's like this a blue blade is indication of a jedi guardian like obi-wan A green blade is indication of a Jedi Counselor, like Qui-Gon. And finally, a yellow blade is the indication of a Jedi Sentinel. So, is Rey... If Rey now has a yellow-bladed lightsaber, does this make her a Jedi Sentinel? I don't know, it just seemed like an odd choice of color of a lightsaber for Rey. Finally, at the end of the movie, after Kylo sacrifices himself to bring Rey back... And this is before she goes to the planet to bury the lightsabers. Two of them kiss, and then Kylo dies and disappears. Now, this movie didn't do anything in terms of character relationships, which I'm good with because the the thing didn't really have time for it. But I thought that Rey and Rey had a thing for Finn. Where did this sudden kiss come from? Was it more of a thanks for your sacrifice kiss? Or and not a uh, I love you kiss. But then if Rey had a thing for Finn, why does it seem in The Last Jedi that Finn has a thing for Rose? Obviously in this movie, he doesn't really care about Rose. Because new female character that has a similar backstory to his own is now the person he's got a thing for. And no, I cannot remember her name at all. Like Rose just got a pat on the shoulder from Finn as he and the new female character person went and blasted the bridge of the, that commanding Star Destroyer. Yeah, Rose got put in the friend zone. There was another new female character that was on the planet they went to so they could get into C-3PO's memory to make him translate the language of the Sith. Don't worry, I will get to C-3PO in a minute. Now... This new female character is Zori Bliss. This is different from the one I was talking about that Finn now has a crush on. She has a past with Poe that's sort of mentioned, but she's joining the gang anyway and takes them to where they need to go. The funny thing is that when we're introduced to her, she seems to not be the best fan of Poe, but after the C-3PO surgery, she seems to be warmed up enough to Poe To not completely hate him, but of course through the movie it seems that Zori and Poe's past had something romantic in it that Poe tries to drudge up, but Zori is not having any of that. Not even enough to give him a kiss at the end of the movie, but hey, this movie doesn't have time for it. 
Now, the C-3PO thing is that he has a little more importance in the movie. One task they had to do while on the planet that the party was happening was to find this old Sith guy's ship, the one that tracked down Ray's parents, because he had a clue to one of the two Sith Wayfinders. The clue ends up being a dagger with Sith inscriptions on it, so C-3PO reads it, translates it, but he's not able to speak it because of programming restrictions. They even lose the dagger thing, and so C-3PO says that only his memory banks has what the dagger says, so they take him to a planet that they meet Zori, and she takes them to a place that they will go to, they will go through to be able to get C-3PO to speak Sith. The downside is that C-3PO will lose his memories, and so he gets a moment before the wipe to look at the faces of his friends one last time. They do the surgery, C-3PO awakens with red eyes to speak the Sith message, and then memory wipe. But it's all good, because later R2-D2 restores his memory. Either way, it's nice to give C-3PO a moment like that. Now I come to the Emperor. Palpatine seemed very odd to be there in this movie. Where has he been the entire time? The entire trilogy before this movie? How did he even survive his death and return of the Jedi? He's hooked up to some machine that's obviously keeping him alive in this large throne room, but his room is weird too because it seems like they're in an arena sometimes, but when Rey initially enters the room, all these crowd people seem like they're etched into the wall like a carving. Who are these crowd people supposed to be? My thought is that... That's all the fallen Sith, but I don't really know what it's supposed to be. <clears throat> My biggest confusion with Palpatine is at the end of the movie when Kylo and Rey are going to face him down and he just uses Sith magic to take their life essence and then br puts it in himself, bringing Palpatine back to like full strength. How did he know how to do that? Did he just figure it out on the spot? Yeah, so then Palpatine does uh, lightning hands into the space battle. That particular space battle was odd. The Resistance goes into this area with 10,000 Star Destroyers to try to take out a navigation thing that one of their generals figures out the plan, so he makes their command ship the navigation thing. Battle goes basically really bad for the Resistance until like thousands of other people's ships show up and then the battle goes more in favor of the Resistance. I didn't really get the point of using horses to infiltrate the ship other than the fact that they can't be disabled like that one First Order General said. If they had speeders, they could have disabled them. I also can't... I also find that the hyped up Sith Troopers were just as bad as regular Stormtroopers. Like, I like the look of Sith Troopers and want a figure of it, but I really thought they'd be better than the regular Stormtroopers, and they're not. They're just red stormtroopers that still can't hit anything. Kylo goes through a lot in this movie too. He starts out with his normal, I'm hunting for Rey, and they would almost meet but not quite yet. It's not until they're on the planet with the remains of the Death Star and are having their lightsaber duel that Kylo really has a change and this will bleed into the relationship, not romantic, between Kylo and Rey. That's because Kylo has the upper hand to kill Rey, but then Leia uses the Force link to stop Kylo, make him drop his lightsaber, which allows Rey to grab it and stab Kylo. But that ends up killing Leia, for some reason. Not explained. I have to admit, this the whole Force link, Force dyad thing is utterly confusing. There are moments in the movie where Rey and Kylo are in separate places and are talking to each other, but then they're like lightsaber battling each other which somehow is happening in both of the separate places that Rey and Kylo are in but they're making contact with each other like physically touching each other so back to the lightsaber duel on the Death Star remains once Rey realizes that she just killed Leia um, she decides to force heal Kylo then Kylo has a moment where he has a memory of Han Solo, and he ultimately decides to be Ben Solo, not Kylo Ren, and tosses his lightsaber into the water. Then, when Rey is in front of Palpatine, who's giving his strike me down and take my place speech, Rey decides to fight Kylo, if 
fight. The Ray decides to fight, and Kylo, who had infiltrated, is gunning people down. Suddenly, Kylo is surrounded by the Knights of Ren, who beat him up a bit, but then Ray Force links with him, puts one of the lightsaber hilts behind her back, and then Kylo reaches behind his back and pulls out that second lightsaber she just had. How does that work? Isn't the Force link between their minds? How can they just transport material, physical items from one person to another through a Force link? Now when I looked this up, it's something called a Force Dyad. This is when two beings' minds are bridged, which allows them to see each other no matter the, how far away they are. As the link gets stronger, the two are able to transfer part of their surroundings into each other's separate location. This can apparently include objects and information as well. One thing I like that Ray did is while Palpatine was doing lightning hands into the space battle, Ray concentrates and is able to get all the strength of past Jedi on her side. <clears throat> she gets up, brings one of her lightsabers to her. Palpatine lightning hands her, but she blocks it. While blocking, she brings the second lightsaber to her to further block the lightning, making a cross or an X out of the lightsaber beams. Begins walking towards Palpatine and then kills him. I really loved that whole scene, but then she falls over and is dead. This is when Kylo comes back and basically exchanges his life force for hers. Then the movie actually ends, with Rey making the statement that she is a Skywalker now. That she saved the galaxy. Because it's not about who you are by blood, but who you make yourself to be. This movie is not as bad as people are making it to be. Before seeing it, I watched Angry Joe's 24 minute non-spoiler video about it and it seemed like he thought the movie was just awful and the worst way to end this trilogy. The big complaints I heard before seeing the movie, at least one was not as bad as people made it out to be. The only bits of fan service to me was having Ghost Luke raised his X-Wing so Ray could use it, and the fact that Billy D. Williams makes his return as General Calrissian. I think that people are being a bit too overdramatic about this movie somehow being worse than it is. At least to me. This movie is not perfect, but it is not terrible either. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is a good and enjoyable movie. That's all I have to say, so for the end of the conversation, leave a comment below. As always, thanks for listening, and goodbye.